Hi everybody, thank you. So let's get started today. We're going to talk about noise source identification. So just a little bit more about me. As mentioned, I, I went to Michigan Tech for my undergraduate. I thought what I wanted to do was um, computer modeling, finite elements, statistical energy analysis, CFD. Um, but I went to work for Electric Boat and uh, um, I thought that's what I was going to do, but ended up the group that I got hired by did not only modeling but also sound and vibration and that's the group that I was put in the day I started and so that's what I did for five years there and uh, then was looking for a job back at, originally from Michigan that's where I'm at now and uh, had the first grandkid on both sides and so the grandparents were um, pressuring a lot to get us to move back and uh, um, came across the lead at Detroit Diesel and sent him a resume and I was looking for pretty much anything you know a mechanical engineer could do back toward the Midwest and I, I remember sitting on the the airplane thinking I just wasted a valuable vacation day and um, their $500 on this plane ticket I don't want to be a stinky diesel engine manufacturer plant engineer I kind of like the sound and vibration stuff and I got to the interview and they said what do you do uh, hang hydrophones down in the water and drive submarines back and forth and do modal analysis on bed plates and box girders and sound intensity maps on bulkheads and hmm, well that's pretty much what we do only it's you know buses and trucks and construction equipment not submarines wow so uh, that's what I did at Detroit Diesel for uh, about 11 years um, ended up becoming the manager of what they called the pilot center anything that didn't have Detroit Diesel Power was a candidate to come in and get a pilot installation and so um, vibration and, and, and noise were um, a good part of that consideration and then ended my career there working on uh, um, a uh, program with Chrysler Corporation on uh, hybrid electric vehicles. Um, we supplied a three-cylinder diesel engine to go in front of the motor generator then a short time at data physics and uh, not right after Michigan Tech but while I was at Detroit Diesel um, got my masters this time um, strictly noise and vibration um, and when I went to work at BNK the last couple of classes that I had were um, array acoustics classes and uh, I became the the array guy for the Americas for Bruin Care and that's what we're going to talk about today so noise source identification really kind of started out um, with a military application. World War I, all of a sudden, um, war wasn't waged on horseback and wagon. It was motorized vehicles, airplanes that, that could be on top of you before you could hear them practically, dropping bombs and shooting. And you know, every second's advance notice was, was worth it. And so these, these were actual devices that were used trying to figure out what direction an airplane was coming from um, and give that couple extra seconds of warning before it came in. Then uh, you know, later on electronic devices started uh, um, coming into play and sound level meters. We could quantify what is the level at this location Is it and decide is it too loud or not. And then later on we'll talk a little just a little bit more about um, sound intensity mapping. So uh, sound intensity, instead of a scalar quantity, we could get a vector quantity and we could turn it into a map. Not only what's the level, but where is it coming from? What, what area is louder than the next to identify where do we want to focus our attention on making it quieter or blocking the noise or, or some kind of mitigation. So really the first um, electronic noise source identification was sound intensity mapping. Uh, a guy at General Motors Research in the 70s came up with a theory for it and wrote a paper and um, if Brulin Care wasn't the first, I'm pretty sure we were the first, but if we weren't we were, were right in there in the first of the um, commercial products available for sound intensity mapping. Then uh, a holography, oh my picture got moved there. Um, Near-field acoustic holography, we'll talk just a little bit more about that next, but um, Bruin Care was the first company to have a product on the market in the, actually in the, the 1980s. Um, 
then uh, through the uh, um, 80s and 90s, things moved around, moved along uh, uh, sort of slow, but around 2000, things really started taking off for um, array acoustics in particular for noise source identification. Beamforming that actually came out of um, World War II sonar technology, phased arrays, became very popular. We came up with a, um, a beamforming and holography array, a combo array. Patch holography, conformal holography. We'll talk just a little bit about spherical. That's not the focus of our talk today, but we'll, we'll mention that just a little bit. Moving source for pass by, conformal, sound quality metrics. Um, make a little mention of that. And, and then what we're really going to talk about today is the acoustic camera. Um, the technology behind it, the, the algorithms, really were not new in 2015. The, the new thing about the acoustic camera was it was handheld um, and has this plate on it. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And probably the biggest thing was the, the cost. They, they bundled it, we put it together so that it could be much more affordable. But even bigger than that is the ease of use. When I started uh, at BNK, actually 20 years ago this year, um, array systems were, I mean, there was nothing under 100,000, more like 200,000, and not something that uh, a, the sales engineer could quote, let alone um, demo, he, really either one of them. So I was intimately involved with, with all the, the um, demo process, if a customer was interested in it, something that could be helpful for them, um, and then help with the quoting process, but I, I couldn't even do it. It had to go to Denmark and at our headquarters, and we had a special projects office that did the quoting and put the system together. And then once the system was delivered, every system required at least three to five days of system setup and training. Well, that was the, the biggest innovation change that came with the um, BK Connect acoustic camera was it was incredibly simpler to use and operate and the sales guy could quote it. It was a bundle that everything was there, didn't have to go back to Denmark. And in fact, you know, back when I started, like I said, I was intimately involved with all the systems that were delivered. I knew the customers and since 2015, I've gotten more than one call from a customer that said, hey, I just uploaded the new version and what's this new button or where did, what, what does this mean? What do you mean? Uploaded the new version. When did you buy this? Well, we've had it for three years. What? I didn't even know you owned one. The sales guy took it in and demoed it, did the quote, sold it, went in to give them a, a half an hour of, of uh, startup training, and I wasn't in, even involved in the process. So much easier for the sales guy and for, the, for customers to use. So the first thing we'll talk about is near-field acoustic holography. The acoustic camera does both holography and beamforming, and we'll talk about why with that. Um, holography, this, this is the, the equation here that is a full semester graduate level course on this equation. It came out of solving this equation, the wave equation. Um, back in the 1950s, 1960s, through a number of, of papers and, and um, steps, People trying to solve this found, uh, if you remember back to differential equations, the Laplace transform, it doesn't work. Someone came up the, with the idea of using Fourier integrals instead of Laplace to solve it. It worked, everybody was happy. Um, you can see this, I mean, it is literally a 15 week graduate level class on this equation. The math gets pretty hairy. Then in the 1970s, somebody looked at it and said, you know, um, and he's the one that coined the term holography, you know, now we measure microphones, measure the time domain, we do an FFT to go to the frequency domain, and basically what they did then is 
on every row and every column of data at every frequency, they do a discrete Fourier transform into this wave number domain, and that's where they solve the equation. And it's sort of like if you took this array, you measure 2D data, and then extrude it in and out of the source, and you can calculate the acoustic properties anywhere, model them anywhere in that 3D space. So sort of like you take 2D pictures and turn it into a 3D hologram, you measure 2D acoustic data and turn it into a 3D holography. So we've become pretty comfortable over the years with doing an FFT from time to frequency. There are some pitfalls, but everybody's pretty comfortable aliasing, leakage, we get around it. But doing this Fourier transform, discrete Fourier transform into the wave domain has similar, uh, there's, there's uh, um, aliasing with this that we have to put up with, but there's also edge effects. So the theory says measure an infinite plane in the x and the y direction with infinitely close together microphones and you'll know everything about everything in all space. Well, infinite plane, not very practical or possible, so you have some finite plane, but if there's a source over here and the microphones measure that, they hear it, it has to do something with that energy and it lumps it up on the edges. And so if you see a source here, do you know that that's really a source here or is that a source out here that it's an edge effect? So we had some schemes to, to try to move that edge effect data out and throw it away. But um, then in the 90s, um, some people started coming up with ideas of ways to go directly from the measurement plane to the calculation plane. Skip the whole wave number domain. And that's what we call our zona, statistically optimized near-field acoustic holography. And that, because you're not doing a, a Fourier transform, you don't have to have evenly spaced microphones, just evenly distributed microphones. So if you noticed on that, that array, um, they were kind of random looking there, but they are evenly distributed so that we can go right from the measurement plane to the calculation plane. We also have um, handheld arrays with evenly spaced microphones, both single layer and dual layer, double layer, that can be used for conformal mapping. One of the things though that can be done with the double layer, because single layer arrays, whether it's beamforming or holography, they have the, the um, disadvantage, the attribute, the quality, that all sources and sinks in front of and behind the array are mapped in front. So with the beamforming array, if you point it at your face and you whistle, you see a nice little spot right on your mouth. If you turn it around and point it away from you and whistle, you see a nice little spot, but of course no you because you're behind the array it can't tell the difference. be an issue, what we, and with intensity mapping, you would add the two of the, those together, or if you pointed it away from you and whistled, you'd see that energy was flowing in this direction or in that direction, so you could tell which direction it was. But there is such thing as an acoustic sink. You think about a, a port on a, um, a speaker. Energy can flow into that port at, at certain frequencies, and does that mean, if you measure that, does that mean energy is flowing into that port or is it a source behind? Which is it? So if you think about sitting in it um, on an airplane in seat 27A and you look out the window and say, I'd like to know how much sound is coming from that engine hanging off the wing there. And you could get out your handy dandy sound intensity probe and map the wall there. And what you'd get is how much was coming from that engine through the, the fuselage wall, minus how much was coming from this engine through the wall, plus how much was coming from behind the microphone or the, the intensity probe, reflecting off the wall and, and going back out again. And there's no way to separate those pieces out. But with a dual sided array, because it can tell is it a source or sink in front of or behind the array, which, which way is the, the energy flowing? Before you went up in the air, you could put a source in the cabin, measure how much goes in, how much comes out, so now you basically have the absorption coefficient of that wall. Then when you're in the air, 
measure how much is coming from behind, and then from that absorption coefficient, you can figure out how much is coming from behind is going to be reflected and come back again and break all those pieces apart. So that's not the acoustic camera, but that is another array capability that's out there. And one of the things that comes out of that is you can calculate in situ absorption coefficient. So the other technology is beamforming. The way beamforming works is you have all these microphones and you record the data and then in post-processing you say, okay, if there was a source here, we know the speed of sound and air, we know the position of the microphone, so it's going to hit this microphone first and then we can calculate so many microseconds later it'll hit this microphone, so many microseconds later, right on down the line. If we apply those delays and sum all those signals up, any source at this location is going to be huge. And if it's from somewhere else, the delays aren't quite going to line up and it's, the level is going to be smaller. So then we adjust the del delays over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And we get the source strength at each point in the calculation plane. We can transform to the frequency domain, band pass it, and map it, and identify sources. Well, the challenge with beamforming is once your microphone positions are set, for every location, for every frequency, there's a sensitivity curve that, that looks like this. When you're pointing at this location, you have the, the full beam here, but there are these side lobes. And you can think of these side lobes this microphone spacing for whatever frequency we're looking at because of the wavelength it lines up at some location that it catches the next wave in this summation and so if that microphone spacing repeats over and over and over and over again that location gets more and more and more sensitive and so what this means is so say you're pointing at this location and just for sake of argument zero db no source there it's below zero dB. But at this location, you have a 100 dB source. So when you come up with a number for this location, what you're going to get is 100, 90, 85 dB, an 85 dB ghost image here. But there's no way to tell the difference between the ghost image and a real image. So what that means is if this is the highest side load that you have at this frequency, you can't map 16 dB or you're going to have ghost images and the data is going to be kind of useless. You have to have your your display range less than 15 dB. So the challenge is come up with a design that pushes these side lobes down as far as possible with as few microphones as possible. Because you can if you use cheap mics and cheap A to D's you can just keep adding more more microphones and this number is the total and so by adding more presumably you know, with a little bit of smarts you can have the side lobes have fewer repeated microphone spacings in the array well even if your microphones and A to D are cheap you still have more data to deal with then either you transform it on the fly and you only have frequency domain or you save that data and yeah, data is pretty cheap these days, but you still have to deal with it. You have to store it, you have to pull it into memory to reprocess it, and archive it somehow. So the challenge is to push down the, the number of channels required to get a good maximum side lobe suppression, as few channels as possible. So one of the things with beamforming, usually Beamforming is considered to be a mid to high frequency noise source identification tool and holography uh, mid to low. And in both cases, um, the reason for that is resolution. And what I mean by that is spot size. So if you have a point source and an infinitely small point source, there will be some spot size associated with that in the map. And for beamforming, that's related to wavelength. So if you have a very tiny point source at 1,000 hertz, you end up with about a one foot spot. And 500 is about two feet, 250 is about four feet. And conversely, as you go higher in frequency, the spot size gets smaller and smaller. So people will usually talk about 500 to 1,000 hertz being sort of the low end useful frequency range for beamforming. 
And of course, that totally depends on the size of the um, the object that you're trying to map, and you know, how how closely do you have to define what the source is. I've used beamforming down to 125 hertz on pieces of, pieces of large construction equipment that were you know, meters and meters long. That we wanted to know is that that drum up at the front, the drum in the back, the diesel engine hydraulic motor, or the exhaust that's the the main source and an eight foot spot size was plenty to identify which one it was but if you're looking at something the size of a laptop going down to 250 hertz is kind of pointless because it's going to say it's coming from somewhere around in the vicinity of that object then on top of the wavelength um, acoustic camera. One of the reasons that uh, it's called a camera is it has a number of attributes that are similar to a camera. So um, the resolution with a camera, you know, if you use the camera on your phone and you reach your arm out and you take a selfie with some celebrity, everybody can tell who the celebrity is if they know who it is. But if you take that same camera and take a shot across the Grand Canyon and, you know, oh, the Kardashians were on the, the glass bridge. Yeah, so I, there's no matter how much you blow it up, you're not going to be able to tell who it was. What happens with beamforming, as you move back farther and farther, that wavelength times the ratio of the array diameter to distance away is the spot size. So the farther back you move, Yes, the, the larger and larger area you can map, but the spot size grows with it. So you don't want to go on the other side of the room and try to map a cell phone. Even if you're looking at you know, 2000 hertz, it's going to say it's somewhere around the cell phone. But if you get very close to it, you can say it's coming out of the top speaker, the bottom speaker, or both. So as you go lower and lower in frequency, the spot size grows and grows. Holography, also spot size related to half the wavelength. So as you go down in frequency, the spot size gets larger and larger. But with holography, there's a hard cutoff at the distance you are away from the source. And near field acoustic holography, you want to be very close. And the rule of thumb is one microphone spacing. So if you have an evenly spaced array, um, you say four inches between microphones you want to be about four inches away with a combo array like the acoustic camera um, it's nominal microphone spacing say two or three inches away in, in the case of the acoustic camera you go down to 150 hertz that I don't know, has this huge wavelength you have a spot size that's two or three inches so that makes it very good for low frequency if you think of um, near field acoustic holography in terms of traditional where you do that discrete Fourier transform from the frequency domain to the wave number domain that's kind of like your sample rate doing a, an FFT from time to frequency so if you don't sample fast enough you'll get aliasing if you think about having a, a microphone spacing say of 10 centimeters and you want to look at um, six and a half kilohertz that has about a one one inch or two 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 and a half inch centimeter wavelength there are a number of waves in between each of your microphones that you just don't have information on. So the microphone spacing limits the high frequency. And so you know, as you move the microphones closer and closer together, you can go higher and higher in frequency. But at some point you have to ask, am I measuring my sound field or my sound field interrupted by a wall of microphones? Usually people will consider uh, 6 to 12 kilohertz kind of being the, the upper end of, of useful um, holography measurement. Um, our uh, closest spaced holography mi microphone array um, goes to six and a half kilohertz. It's about uh, two and a half, about, about, about an inch, two and a half centimeters. Um, although having said that, we have a, a, um, a holography system that measures well into the teen kilohertz for things like um, hearing aids. But another issue there is as you go closer and closer together either the array gets smaller and smaller and you map, map a very tiny area hearing aids pretty small so that's not a, an issue there 
or you add more and more and more channels. So if you, you want to measure this something, you know, the size of a jet engine out to 20 kilohertz, yes, you could do that, but you'd have to have thousands and thousands and thousands of channels or many, many movements of a smaller array. But with beamforming, going into the higher frequency isn't as dependent on the number of channels. So beamforming makes more sense for higher frequency, holography for lower frequency. So this is not part of the directly part of the acoustic camera, but something that can be done to reduce that spot size for beamforming is a, uh, a deconvolution technique that came out of Hubble Space Telescope technology, actually. So they, they open up the shutter and look uh, billions of years back in time at a, at a galaxy far, far away and have to leave the, the shutter open for some length of time to get enough light in to characterize it. And in that time, the satellite is not perfectly still and has a little bit of a wobble or vibration to it and movement. And so instead of a nice sharp spot, they get a smudge. And so this is easier for me to explain in terms of acoustics than optics. Um, what we do is create these point spread functions. So this is all virtual in the computer. We take a point source, propagate it onto the array, and come up with a spot. Then move it and do the same thing. So for all frequencies, for all locations, we have these point spread functions. Then you do your delay and sum. You get this big blob. And then we have an algorithm that tries to fit those point spread functions, sum them up to come up with something that looks just like this, and do it within so many iterations and come up with uh, a, a certain error epsilon within that number of iterations, and then say, okay, so it's not this plus this plus 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 plus. It's a point source here plus a point source here plus a point source here. And so what you end up with is a much smaller spot size. This is data from a, a wind tunnel, so no engine running, just 70 mile an hour wind flying by, and an array overhead. Delay in some gives you, you know, pretty big blobs, and the deconvolution cuts down the spot size quite a lot. So another thing that you can do in post-processing is selective beam forming. And what that is is map only the sound that's coherent with a reference transducer. So a microphone or an accelerometer. An example that kind of makes this clear why, why you'd need this is uh, imagine getting your car started up and you hear tick, 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 and a valve uh, lifters or something ticking and you go, oh, that's coming from the engine. And you climb out and open up the hood and you don't hear tick, 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 you hear rah, 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 the engine running. And if you took your array and you mapped the engine compartment, you wouldn't map the tick, 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 you'd map the rah, 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 because it's louder out there, even though it's not getting through to the passenger compartment. But if you took a microphone and hung it at the driver's ear location in the passenger compartment, and then mapped only what was coherent with that microphone, now all the rah, rah, rah is pushed down because it's not getting to the driver's ear and the tick 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 pops right up. So here um, I've got a little shop back and a, a toy uh, um, front end loader running and all you can hear is the shop back. You don't hear this guy running at all. So here's side by side just the delay and sum of both of them running and it's very dominated by the shop back. If you're sitting there listening to it, it's very obvious that's all you can hear. But if we look at the selective forming reference to that accelerometer, the shop back goes away, and all you see is the, the little toy running. So another technology that is separate from um, the acoustic camera, but another technology that's out there is spherical beam forming. And spherical beam forming maps 180 degrees from North Pole to South Pole, rotated 360 around the equator. So you get the entire um, environment mapped all at once rather than just what's in front of you. So this, it has cameras in it, stitches them together and unwraps it into a 2D picture. This is the inside of a vehicle and it's kind of analogous to unwrapping um, 
the the globe into a 2D map of the world, but it's kind of weirder to look at from the inside out. But you can see the, the front windshield here, driver's door, passenger's door, rear pass or rear driver, sorry, driver, driver, front passenger, rear passenger, a little bit of the back window, the rest of the back window, steering wheel, the two seats, sunroof up here. And this this is uh, some data that before the product was released in uh, almost 15 years ago now, 2007, 2008, um, a guy from Denmark came over to the U.S. and we were acquiring some data um, to write a, an SAE paper. And I, I don't think this data made it into the, the paper, but um, we had one of those little iPod FM transmitters that we were transmitting uh, um, just random noise, white noise to the, the stereo system of the car. And it was an old car at the time, but it was supposed to have an eight speaker symphony sound system. And we were only counting four speakers and uh, kept, oh, you know, maybe maybe they're band passed and moving frequencies around. And, and finally turned it back on and went in and stuck my head next to each speaker. And sure enough, four of them were completely gone. And uh, this back speaker was pretty, pretty well dead. You really couldn't hear it over the sound of the other ones, but it got mapped there. Um, and because we were releasing this product, we had invited local people and a, a guy from one of the uh, um, uh, big three auto company spinoffs came that was involved with um, uh, car audio systems. And he got very excited because the rear speaker was not on the speaker, it was on the rear window. I, I don't know, that made him really excited because um, you know, they once once the the angle of the rear um, window is set, uh, the, I guess they spend a lot of time adjusting those rear speakers to fill the cabin with sound the way they want it to. So here here's another thing that you can do. Th this is with the sphere that uh, um, this data was taken with, but it can be done with the acoustic camera and it can be done right on on the screen with the acoustic camera. What you can do is listen to a point. So this is. Uh, Every year we have the Detroit s &V event, um, three days that uh, we have product classes that are specific training classes for products and um, classes that are more theory and training, principles of acoustics, principles of vibration. And one of them is advanced noise source identification. And so this was in that classroom. You can see the front wall here, one of the side walls, the other side wall. Out the back, there's a, an archway, the other half of the archway there, and the front row of tables, half there and half there. And there's me sitting in the front of the room. This was before anybody came in. And you can listen to... Ooh, ooh. So this is just one of the microphones, raw data. You can hear me whistling and hear the, uh, um, hear the loons there. And so then what you can do, so there's me, there's a whistle and the little dot is the cursor, and we can listen to that cursor point. So there's me whistling. Then here in the raw data, I had a uh, radio station playing on my computer, and in the raw data, you really couldn't hardly hear it. But listening to that point, you can hear the, the radio station. Then finally, um, in the end, you heard the loons. In the beginning, there were the crickets that you really couldn't even hear. A little app on my phone. That's what you could hear is the loon in the end. So that's kind of handy for, um, especially looking for sound quality kind of issues that aren't necessarily the loudest, but annoying. And so you can look at the map and, oh, here's the loudest area. That's what we have to go after. Eh, maybe not and listen to some lower level or, or you know in this case you have levels that look the same in different frequency bands which one is it we're looking for and you can listen to the individual sources and say yes that's it another thing that can be um, done with the sphere is turned into to hats data sound quality mapping uh, this can be done with the acoustic camera it is a post-processing event but it can be done so the car companies have um, switched all their specs for their suppliers, uh, power window regulators, seats, steering wheel, um, sunroofs. 
they used to have to live to a DBA level. Now it's a loudness. So instead of DBA, it so sounds. Um, if you've bought a vent fan for your kitchen or bathroom at you know, Home Depot or Lowe's, on the boxes, there's no DBA, no more DBAs. I guess that's been quite a while. They were the first ones, some of the first ones to make the switch. Um, now it's a sewn level. That's a much better indication of, of how it's perceived. Um, a, a lot of different metrics we can map, as well as if you do a um, jury test and you have a preference equation that combines all the different uh, um, metrics to come up with a, a, a single equation that predicts how your jury will, will rank. We can map that. And uh, looking at different sound quality metrics, say loudness, you never know. Um, a lot of times the highest sound pressure level is the highest loudness level. Sometimes it's not. And there's no way really to know for sure until you do the map. Then the acoustic camera. So the plate on the front here, um, the reason that's on there is because all sources in front of and behind the array are mapped in front of the array. So by having this carbon fiber um, plate with absorptive material on the back makes it a little, little more accepting of not so friendly environments. The whole system, this is the, the whole thing right here, um, it fits in a Pelican case that can go on a, an airplane or easily shipped FedEx or UPS to DHL, whomever, and a laptop. The front end is connected with five connectors for 30 channels. It has a battery in it, so with one battery it'll go for between one and two hours. A second battery can be added that'll take you out to about three hours. Connecting to the laptop is a LAN cable to the front end and a USB cable for the, the camera that's at the center of it. And so here's an example of how it can be used. I have a problem. I suppose I could put my head next to each one to figure out which one is squeaking, but it'd be funner if we could see it. So you can see it identifying the squeak right there on uh, the rear wheels, and I did get a brake job done the next week. Um, I, I mentioned early on that a lot easier to use the acoustic camera with BK Connect, and that uh, um, unlike in the past with Array Acoustics, the sales guys actually go out and run this and demo it. And this was the, um, the first time the sales guy had had it. He went into a company that was making motors for CPAPs and they, they build these things and put them on this big rack to run them in and make sure they're, they're not going to have any issues. They run in for so long, it's not a very friendly environment, pretty loud. And so uh, up to this point, the way they tested was a guy just walked around, put his ear next to each one of these things to find the bad one. And, and they put a bad one in to make sure that it, uh, it was there. But the sales guy um, fired it up and there it was. And when you when you start it up, this is what you see on the screen. It comes up running. The picture's there, the map is there, and uh, yeah, you have to tweak around the, the frequency range. Um, he lucked out, it was pretty close to one of these peaks when it started, and he just moved right over on top of the peak, and boom, there it was. It identified the right motor that was having the problem. Even though all the other motors were running, that was the the bad one. So this, again, one of our sales guys, in fact, Vince, um, had a, a hard drive that had a whistle to it and uh, set the array up there. And there it is. And again, you just move, the, you see the spike, you move the delta cursor, you can resize it and move it around and pick exactly the frequency range that you want to look at. Another thing, um, laptop keyboards have an issue if the, the different keys start resonating. So you're playing your music, you don't want to hear the keyboard resonating, you want to hear your music. So 
leak detection on a headset onto a head and torso. You could hear the difference where he puts his finger on it and see he kind of moved it so it had another leak there. Here we have a bunch of speakers putting out 200 hertz tone. And then an additional speaker will be brought in that has some rub and buzz associated with it. And we'll see how it can pick that out pretty easily. So identifying speaker problems would be pretty straightforward. next one. So it's the same thing, only a couple of mouth uh, simulators here, artificial mouths, that are overdriven so they're generating some rub and buzz, buzz issues too. Fix those right out. son got a, a drone for Christmas. There you can see it. So at full distance it's a good 30 or 40 feet away up near the top of the trees and then out toward my driveway there and does a pretty good pretty good job of following it. Then finally so here we have Bose frames. It's just random noise, so it, it, uh, I'll just stop it to look at it. So the, these are the sunglasses with the speakers in them. So it's kind of interesting if you, you look at the uh, um, pattern here right over the ear for the speech frequency range. 500 to 5K right over top of the ear. But if you look a little higher in frequency, whoop, so you're not hearing that. Okay, this is uh, you know, 5K to 9K, not, not needed for speech communication. Uh, maybe a, a pretty limited MP3 doesn't have anything up that high, I don't know. But try to listen to any um, more higher fidelity audio it's not even pointing at your ear. Kind of interesting. But I think this has uh, been pointed out in a number of the reviews that are out there for the mid mid frequency range speech, mid frequency range of, of uh, speech. It's great, but higher frequency, not so good. And with that, thank you and questions.